Our reading this afternoon is in uh, the first book of Corinthians, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that, that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but it, that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet, I will show you the most excellent way. And I Great, thank you so much. Uh, and welcome, welcome. Let's move this and hopefully I'll quieten down a little bit. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. As you came in, if you weren't here last week, you should have been given uh, one of these Find Your Story booklets um, and a City Church pen. Um, if you haven't got one of those, if you wave, someone from the welcome team will put one of those into your hand. So just give us a wave. There's a up, up top, one or two. Great. Um, and what you need to do is you need to keep this open in front of you 
and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 open in front of you. I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive into that together. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that uh, you are a God who gives and gives and gives and gives. Your mercy knows no end. And we pray as we look at the gifts that you have given us for the common good, that that we would see how those are rooted in your character as the giving, the the self-giving God. Amen. Well, I wonder, have you ever done a Myers-Briggs test? Uh, it's, It's a personality test where you complete a questionnaire, and the questionnaire seeks to find out how you perceive the world and how you go about making decisions. And then what it does is it categorizes you into one of several different personality types. It is a bit of a wooden mechanism, but it's actually quite fun to do. And a few years ago, we did that Myers-Briggs test as a staff team. It turns out that I am an ENTJ, which, which apparently is the most common personality type for a pastor. As well as being common for pastors, it puts me in the same personality group as Margaret Thatcher, Steve Jobs, I'll take that, Arnold Schwarzenegger, take that as well, and Voldemort. (laughs) Nice. Uh, You might be interested to know that Matt, Matt is an INTJ. That puts him in the same category as Jane Austen. I can see that with Matt. Jay-Z, slightly less. Uh, Russell Crowe, gladiator. And Sherlock Holmes, I can definitely see that with Matt. Um, Emma. Emma, our operations manager, she is an ESTP. So she's in there with Al Capone, Camilla, Prince Charles's wife, Donald Trump, and Judy Dench. You can see why we make a great team at City Church, can't you? Now today, today is our second talk in the Finding Your Story series. And we're going to be thinking about spiritual gifts from that chapter that Helen just read, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's a danger, I fear, that we can dive into this chapter in Myers-Briggs mode. Be thinking today and then later in the week in our Connect session, be thinking, well, oh, goody, goody, I I like this sort of thing. At last, I'm going to find out what sort of Christian I am. What sort of gifts I've been given and where that puts me in the kind of status scheme of the life of the church. Am I a preacher? Am I a connect group leader? Perhaps I could be the next church treasurer. That might be how we approach today, but but if we do, that would be a real mistake. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's not an introspective exercise of finding out what sort of Christian we are. And nor is this week of finding your story in the connect group that follows it. It's not about trying to work out what talents I have and using those in the church. That's completely different. Last week, Matt took us through God's story in Genesis chapter 1. It was to introduce the series, and and he showed us the incredible tapestry that that God created when he made the heavens and the earth. How how every part of the creation, it is designer, it it is tailor-made, but then he showed us how the tapestry had been torn when sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3. And now God equips his people, he equips the church... To go to the places where the tapestry is wearing thin and take responsibility. To repair it. To renew it. And the question is, will you join in? Will you step up and take responsibility? Will you get involved in repairing the threats of this city's tapestry. 
uh, when I was at secondary school, that there was a boy in my year who stood a, a kind of foot taller than all the other boys, myself included. He, he had, he had uh, long flowing hair and he had a winning smile and the girls loved him. His name was Jago and we used to say Jago thought that he was God's gift to women. Well, I've got something to tell you today. If you're here and you're a Christian, then you are God's gift to the church. You are. Whether you're a beautiful type or whether you're an aesthetically challenged type, whether you're really, really clever or you're slightly dull, whether you're the life and soul of the party or, or, or as shy as a mouse, you are God's gift to the church. That's what spiritual gifts are all about. That is what our story in this four-week series is all about. It's not about growing in, growing in self-understanding. It's about growing in other serving. It's not about finding your story so that you find your status. It's about finding your story so that you find your service. I've got one simple statement for us today from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, followed by two short questions. This is the statement. God has gifted you in a unique way to be a gift to others. Three parts to that. First of all, God has gifted you. We're plunging into the, to the middle of a book of the Bible. That's always a dangerous thing to do. And this particular chapter is possibly the most controversial chapter in the whole of the Bible. I need to be up front with you this afternoon. I am not going to deal with all the controversial issues in this chapter. It's just not possible for me to do that today. But what I want to do at the outset is I want to help us to understand the context of what Helen has just read. So Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth, and Corinth was a city in ancient Greece, and it was a city that was full of idol worship. And from chapter 10 onwards... Paul has been addressing what worship looks like in the church in a city that is full of idol worship. He wants to show how it's different to what's going on outside. And then in chapters 12 to 14, he turns to the topic of the use of spiritual gifts in worship. Now, now those words, spiritual gifts, they're, they're first used... In verse 1 of our Bible translations, gifts of the Spirit. But, but that's not a great translation of the original. The, the word used there in the original in verse 1, more literally, it simply means spiritual things. And what Paul's wanting to do here is, is to contrast the way that the Christians in Corinth behaved before they were Christians, when they were pagans, verse 2, with how they're now supposed to behave, now that they are Christians, now, verse 1, that they are spiritual people. And he's saying, if you get that right, if you get right the difference between what you once were and what you now are today, it will totally transform the way that you use your spiritual gifts. Now, the word for spiritual gifts actually comes up for the first time in verse 4, and it's the Greek word charismata. Charismata. And, and the word charis simply means grace, which tells us that the things that we're talking about today, they are grace gifts. They are free, unmerited, undeserved Gifts, grace, gifts. Now it's important to recognise that the pagan way of things described in verse 2, 
doesn't think about these things like that. The pagan way of thinking, it, it prefers to describe these gifts as being talents, skills, competencies, aptitudes. It, it prefers to describe them as things that we have achieved through our own hard work, through our own determination, through our own training of ourselves. We have built up these skills and gifts and talents. They are ours. They belong to us. They are what gives us status and respect. Because, verse 2, verse 2, we primarily want to use these things to serve our dominant idol. And what is our dominant idol today? Well, surely it's ourself for most of us. If we say our gifts are our skills, then we choose to use them to serve our own glory rather than to serve others. But verse 4 reminds us that everything we have, even our natural abilities, like, like our strength or our, our ability in numeracy or, or our seemingly natural ability to make loads of money, all of those skills, they're gifts, undeserved, charismata. You know, the gifts being talked about here in this chapter, they're, they're a particular sort of gift. They're not merely natural abilities, things that we were born with. They are supernatural abilities. God the Holy Spirit, according to verse 4, distributes them. When they use, verse 6, God is at work. And indeed, they are a, a manifestation, that, that means an appearing, of the Holy Spirit. And here is the incredible thing. Every single Christian here today has them. Now, we're a diverse bunch in this room, aren't we? There are going to be some people here today who know that they are gifted, who knew that they were gifted from, from week six when their parents told them how gifted they were when they did their first wind-induced smile. And that sense of giftedness, it was only confirmed when the National Academy of Gifted and Talented Youth bestowed honours on them age 13. Some of us are like that. We have no problem in understanding we're gifted. But some of us are a bit different. Some of us are those who, who dreaded the time in the school playground when they started to pick people for their football team. Because we knew where we featured in that particular pool of players. There are some of us who still have nightmares about when the school report is given out in our school bags. And we're just processing all the different ways we can try and hide them from our parents so they don't see quite how badly we're doing at school. Some of us, we have learned to live with the reality that Gifting is something that someone else has, not us. But look at verse 7 of chapter 12. To each one, each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. If you are a Christian here today, you have the Holy Spirit. There is no other way to become a Christian than to receive the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, he has given you supernatural gifts. Every single one of you. Even those of you who think you're useless. Even those of you who've been told again and again and again that you're really nothing at all. He's gifted you. And you know, we shouldn't be surprised at that. I mean, what else would we expect 
from the Holy Spirit, who on that first Easter morning breathed life into the rotting corpse of Jesus. He's the one who takes what is dead. He is the one who takes what is weak. He is the one who takes what is nothing and makes it everything. Makes it come to truly human life. The the Holy Spirit, he is in the business of turning the world upside down and he has gifted you today, if you're a Christian. And you know, he's done it in a unique way. That's the second part of the statement. Uh, Look at verses four to six. There is one giver, the the Spirit, the Lord, God. But there are many different kinds of gifts. And we're given a flavour of those gifts in verses eight to 11. It's important to say that this list in verses eight to 11, it is not an exhaustive list of all the gifts you can possibly get. It's not like these are the only gifts you can get and you will get at least one of these gifts. How do I know that? Well, because it's not the only list of gifts in the Bible. In fact, it is not the only list of spiritual gifts in this chapter. There's another one, if you just flick over the page, in verse 28. And that other list, it has some overlap, but also some differences. And then there are another four lists in in Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4 as well. Again, overlap in the list, but but differences as well. Now, Now, some of the gifts that are mentioned in those lists and here in chapter 12, they are word ministry gifts. I think that's what the message of knowledge is referring to in verse eight. I think it's talking about a, a message that is, is really rich in, in deep scriptural and theological understanding. I think certainly that the gifts of apostleship and prophecy and, and the gifts of teaching, they are clearly word ministry gifts. But the Spirit doesn't only give word ministry gifts. There are also gifts to facilitate worship, which I think is what the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues is referring to in verse 10 and then verse 30. Then there's the gift of healing there in verse 9 and again in verse 28, which I think it clearly has to include miraculous healing. It must be talking about the miracles done by the apostles to authenticate their ministry. But surely it also includes the way that the Holy Spirit uses the means of medical care to heal. And you know, this this gift is not just talking about physical healing. Verse 28, there's the gift of helping as well, which speaks of getting alongside the weak and the vulnerable, helping the homeless, orphans, Victims of abuse, addicts, those who no one else cares about. But there's also practical management gifts too. That gift in verse 28 of our translations is called the gift of guidance. If you've got another translation, you might see that it's called the gift of administration. Why these two different ones, guidance and administration? I think it's because the sort of administration being described here is is not simply putting papers in the filing cabinets. It is the higher level skills of administration. It means that some members of City Church, they have been gifted to provide strategic oversight for the church, to help us to make big plans, to help us problem solve in the most difficult situations. Some other people, they've been given the gift of faith. I wonder whether you noticed that in verse 9. It's a bit odd, isn't it? What does it mean to have the gift of faith? It's not talking about saving faith here. All Christians have been given the gift of saving faith. There's no other way to believe. But some Christians have been given the gift of faith to take calculated risks. They've been given the faith that really believes in the God of the impossible. The sort of faith 
that is steadfast in praying, that, that sort of makes big, big plans and steps out to take big, big risks because they know God is at work. And that sort of faith is a gift to City Church. And you know, some people, they've been given the gift of financial generosity. That's actually one of the gifts listed in Romans chapter 12. And it's not talking here about the gift of regularly giving to financially support the church. All Christians are called on to do that. Now, what it's describing, it's a sort of gift that God might have given you to be able to make an astonishing amount of money. And then to be able to be generous with it, to give it away, to make things happen for the kingdom that otherwise could not happen, humanly speaking. There is a huge diversity of gifts here. But it seems that there was a group in the church in Corinth who insisted that the gift of tongues, chapter 13, verse 1, tells us a little bit more about this. The gift of tongues is a gift given to help people pray with the angels. And this group in Corinth, they were saying, this is the gift to have. This is the super gift. This is the gift that everyone should have. It's the must-have gift. Now, I don't think that's the problem here at City Church. At least, I don't think it is. We're much more likely, I suspect, to hold out the gift of preaching or or the gift of Bible teaching as the gift that everyone should have, the super gift. we're, We're much more likely to think, if I'm not up front preaching or if I'm not leading a connect group, then I'm not really a fully fledged member of City Church. Well, look at what Paul says in verses 12 to 26. He uses the illustration of a body to describe the church. Read along with me. I'm going to read from verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is... There are many parts, but one body. A human body would be pretty useless if it was made up of a hundred eyes, wouldn't it? And city church would be pretty useless if it was made up of a hundred preachers. We need each other because each one of us has been uniquely gifted by God. I I heard an interesting fact this week. Do you know why fingerprinting is still a really important tool for the police, even in the age of DNA testing? Well, there's this reason. Apparently, identical twins, they, they had the same DNA, okay? But they will very rarely have the same fingerprint. Do you want to know why? Does anyone want to know why is this interesting? Yeah? Good? Well, here is the reason. When a fetus is developing in the womb, uh, the skin forms around the fingers very, very early on. But then later on, another layer of skin forms under the outer layer on the fingertips. And apparently that secondary layer of skin, it grows more quickly than the outer layer that then leads to it pushing up to create the ridges and the folds that give us our fingerprints. Isn't that interesting? And it means that everyone is unique because everyone has developed in a slightly different way. And the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to you are unique because he has shaped and he has formed you in a unique way. As you know, at City Church, there are a number of guys who are being trained up to preach. Some of them you will see preaching here on a Sunday. Some will preach out at other churches. And... We listen to the sermons, we give feedback on those sermons. And every so often I hear one of them 
And I start to feel a little bit uneasy because it sounds a little bit like me or Matt. It's a dead giveaway when they start talking about uh, the warning light on the dashboard of your hearts. We know Matt has had his influence there. But the honest truth is, this church does not need more Matts or more Ralphs. We've got enough. Nor do we need more Joanna Browns, beautiful though her singing is. Nor do we need more Louise Broads on the production desk, excellent though she is. Nor do we need more Kate Walkers serving coffee on hospitality, nor do we need more Paul Rettys doing the live stream. No, we need you. You, in the unique way that God has shaped and formed you for this church. Because the third part of our statement, God has gifted you to be a gift to others. Here's where we get to the fundamental difference between spiritual gifts and talents. There's a difference of origin and also a difference of purpose. So the difference of origin is that spiritual gifts are supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit. They might be based upon the gifts you were given when you were born, but what the Holy Spirit does is he takes those gifts and he enhances and he modifies them. And the reason he does that is because of the second difference, the difference of purpose. These gifts, spiritual gifts, they are given in order to be given away. In order to serve others rather than to serve yourself. Look at verse 7. They are given for the common good. The Bible uses lots of different metaphors to describe the church. So the church, it is described as a bride in Ephesians chapter 5. It's described as a business partnership in Philippians chapter 1. It's described as a family in Titus chapter 2. It's described as a temple in 1 Peter chapter 2. And here in 1 Corinthians 12, it's described as a body. Now something I've noticed here at City Church is that when people talk about the church, they almost always talk about it as family. Now, now there's nothing wrong in that. That is one of the metaphors used in the New Testament. But I do wonder whether the fact that we always use the family metaphor to describe the church betrays something of a distorted view of the church. You see, when we think about the church as family, we rightly think about relationship, about dependence. We rightly think about the things that we receive from others. But you know, that can easily fall into thinking that the church is God's gift to us. It exists for our benefit and our blessing. But remember what we saw at the start. You, you are God's gift to the church. You are a part of the body of Christ who has been uniquely gifted to serve the whole. But what does that look like? Well, it will mean... It will mean you need to identify needs. That's step one. Gaps in the life of the church, people who need to be helped, jobs that need to be done, areas of church life that could be done better, people who are not hearing the gospel who really need to hear the gospel. Then step two. You recognise that God the Holy Spirit has gifted you in particular ways, to meet those needs. And then step number three, you offer to do that for the common good. Uh, Let me give you a brief example of that from last weekend. I I was chatting with my son Jacob uh, 
on Saturday last week about the church social media. I said, Jacob, Jacob, we have come on leaps and bounds with social media. It is looking good, and we're engaging lots more people on the City Church Facebook channel, Instagram, and Twitter. But we're having a problem with YouTube. You know, YouTube views, that people only watch it to watch the sermons. Do you know what Jacob said to me? He said, Dad, how about filming a laser quest competition in Central Hall in the dark? What we could do is we could have the elders against city kids. He said, I, I've seen something similar on YouTube and it's got millions of views. This would be a great way to reach people we're not reaching to show them what City Church is about. Do you know what Jacob did after that? He completed an idea proposal online on My Church Suite offering to help set up this laser quest in order to engage non-Christians through our YouTube channel. And then that was reviewed on Wednesday by the senior leadership team at City Church. What did he do? He identified a need. He saw that he had gifts from watching YouTube to know how to meet that. And he was willing to have courage to step out and put in an idea form to the senior leadership team. He was willing to be a gift to others. So that's the statement of this chapter. You have been gifted by God in a unique way to be a gift to others. Moving on to the questions. Question number one, do you use your gifts? Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. And as Matt said earlier, we're going to be completing a response form, each one of us, which will help us to think through, are we using our gifts? There are three main ingredients for working out what our gifts are. Firstly, there's ability. What am I good at? How has the Holy Spirit gifted me? Number two, passion. What do I care about? What really excites me in life? And then thirdly, opportunity. Where is there a need? Now, our tendency is to start with the first question. What what am I good at? Ability. And if we come into church, looking for how it can give us a platform to use our gifts and our abilities, that can end up being horribly self-serving. We start to see the church as God's gift to us rather than us as God's gift to the church. But you know, there's a danger in coming in on the second ingredient, passion. Because what am I passionate about? Passion's they are often caught. If we see someone who is passionate about Bible teaching, or or if we see someone who's passionate about soup kitchens, or or we see someone who's passionate about helping single parents, we tend to catch their passion. And we assume that that should be our passion too. We project other people's gifts and passions onto ourselves. So can I suggest... Can I suggest that we all start with ingredient three? Where is the opportunity to serve at City Church? Where on the lifeboat of City Church is there a a hole? Where in the lifeboat of City Church are we missing a crew member? Where on the lifeboat of City Church is there a crew member who needs to be trained up better? If you start by asking that question, it will enable you to discover gifts that you never knew you had. Let me give you an example. When I went to train to be a pastor in South Wales, um, Anna and I, we attended a church, just, just literally a stone's throw from the college. And when I joined that church, uh, there were four former pastors on the eldership. They had a preaching team of 12 people. They didn't need more preachers, but they did need more musicians. In fact, they only had one single pianist, not a single guitarist in the whole church. So one of the students who arrived in college, they decided that that even though they could preach, they weren't going to do that. And instead, they took guitar lessons for a whole year 
in order that they could play in the band alongside the pianist. Start with opportunity. Because gifts are given for service, not for status. They are given in order to be given away to others, not used for ourselves. After all, that's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? I mean, God the Son, God the Son is the most gifted being in the universe. He, he's God, after all. He's sovereign. He's supreme. He's almighty. He has every gift in the book. Yet, how did he use his gifts? Well, he saw the need, didn't he? He saw the need of sinful humanity heading headlong into an eternity in hell. And he decided to use his gifts. He decided to channel his passion, his love, to meet the need. And he did that. How did he do that? By being retrained. He took on human flesh, learnt what it was like to be a human. And then hear this from Luke chapter 2. We read that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. God the Son saw the need and retrained his gifts to meet that need for our eternal salvation. So that he could lay down his life in our place. So that he could live our life in our place. So he could serve us and be a ransom for many. Do you use your gifts to serve? And finally, do you use, uh, rather, do you help others to use theirs? Over the next three weeks, as we go about finding our story and connect, will you commit to helping the other members of the group find their story? Verse 28 speaks about the gift of helping. Maybe God has given you the gift of helping others find their gifts. In a church like City, there are certain parts of the body that are more obvious and upfront. There's the band, there's the preacher, there's the city kids workers and the people on welcome. But Paul says, verses 22 to 24, that every part of the body is needed. There is no redundant part of the body of Christ at City Church. We need each other, all of us. And verse 23 tells us that it is those parts of the body that are unseen that need the special treatment. It is those people who lack honour who must be given it. Perhaps you're new to City Church and you're not yet a Christian. You need to know something about City Church. We are a radical community. Because we are radically one. Every single person matters here. Wherever you're from, whatever your race, whatever your age, whatever your background, whether you've been a Christian for an hour or a Christian for 50 years, you are needed. Everyone matters around here. No ifs, no buts. We stand and we fall together. Verse 26, when one of us suffers, we all suffer. When one of us is honoured, we all rejoice. That is the sort of place we are. There is nothing like it in the world. We want everyone to flourish. Because God has given us the most incredible gift in his son. And he has gifted each and every one of us to be a gift to others. So let us commit to finding out what that looks like for ourselves and for each other in a week's ahead. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are generous. Thank you that you gave yourself to us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are generous, pouring out your love and your gifts upon us today. Be at work in us, we pray, that we would know how you have uniquely gifted us to be a gift to others, that we might glorify you and it might delight our hearts as your body here in the centre of Manchester. Amen. <laughs>